of this. I can even get the material. Can we just do this? Yeah. Can we just... Does it not stand up anymore? No, it's fine. Just hold this. Well, it's like... Just get a camera and go Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I just want to listen rather than hold it. Hello. Three. <laughs> Hello. Um, welcome to this event. I'm Felix, organizer of the event, um, part of Blake Hall Arena Victoria. This is William, president of Politics Society, a collaborative event. Yep, this is the first event in which the Politics Society and the PAV um, have a uh, collaboration after PAV became a subcommittee in Polsuk, and we're really excited about this. It's going to be a uh, great series of events, yeah. and we just want to thank PAV and, uh, of course, Felix for yeah, helping course. make this whole thing possible. Yeah, thank, great. You, thank you for everyone who helped out. You know, William, Polsuk, Ashley, um, Maori Party, and all sorts. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> yeah, so, so tonight we've got um, Andrew Judd and Marama Fox. Andrew Judd. Yeah, give them a clap. Andrew Judd was um, previous mayor of New Plymouth, got, got in a bit of media controversy after suggesting the Maori seat, um, you know, all sorts, became a bit of a celebrity up there, um, got comments from Mike Hosking and all sorts. Mike um, Hosking. Yeah. <laughs> Success indicator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ended up having a walk um, in New Plymouth of a few hundred about Maori rights. Um, and also we have Marama Fox, the co-leader of, um, co-leader of Maori Party. Give Boom. her a clap to. <laughs> Maori Party's first list MP. So basically what they're going to do is just going to um, talk, um, uh, talk to you guys about important events, uh, important topics in New Zealand, uh, important topics and whatever else they feel like to discuss, and then uh, we'll possibly go into a short Q&A from the audience. And so, with all that out of the way, we give you Nana, Andrew Judd, and Manama Fox. Hey. Uh, you can come up. Andrew's first up. Uh, <laughs> I voted tonight. <laughs> okay. 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 And the rich just want social welfare handouts. Marys are barbaric. And their language is dead. Marys were lucky they were saved by the British. <laughs> and I'm sick of hearing about the past. And it's time we all moved on. Because actually we're all one now. Do you know who said that to me? I said that to me. My name is Andrew Judd. And I'm a recovering racist. Got it, Andrew. <laughs> in 2013, I was elected to the mayoralty of New Plymouth. And one of my first challenges as a mayor was a question around representation for Māori on council. Because in New Zealand, we are required, by extension of the treaty, you could argue legally, I would argue morally, to include Māori in the decision-making for your community. No. I know. <laughs> it's quite ambiguous, because the options to fulfil this request are very limited. But one of those options is a Māori board seat. So our council decided to uh, propose and put forward the option of the Māori Ward seat for the 2016-17 uh, elections, which triggered a reaction in my community that not only I recognised, I identified with. You know, before I was the mayor, I'd never been on the line. I'd never walked or engaged in the Māori world, had no idea of Māori cultural values, beliefs, couldn't even pronounce place names. The limitation of me was put to QRA, mark one, mark two. Nothing. Yet here I was, the mayor of a district, rich in Māori tradition and culture. I didn't even know about Parihaka. I drove past it many times. Wouldn't have known. Didn't know. 
Says the mirror engaging in the Māori world. Listening to the stories of old. Seeing in the eyes of people the institutionalised trauma that still exists when I heard the stories. Started learning some history, some basic history, of Taranaki, the peka peka block, the land wars, what colonial governments did, how they did it, people who were my ancestors. So I'm in conflict with my indoctrinated view of my colonial safe view of New Zealand. I'm at odds with the feelings and the fears and the, the things I used to say as I just laid out. Because the experience I'm getting couldn't be further from that truth or that lie to me. The truth was actually love and inclusion. So I decided to take myself on. Challenge myself as to why I feel like this. Why did I naturally go to this place and space? Surely I wasn't born like this. And I decided to challenge some of these cliche statements that would just naturally come to my mind. Get over it. Okay, Andrew. Can you explain or define the it? What does the it mean? Because I've never experienced uh, colonisation. I've never experienced the creation of a country with policies that are foreign to my culture. I've never had my language taken from me. I've never been a minority in my own country. I've never been blamed for bad statistics on the back of policies that weren't even culturally mine in the first place. Hmm. No, Andrew, you've got no it to get over. So what gave me this attitude or justification or self-righteousness to demand it of someone else? Never demanded it of himself. I'll tell you what gave me that. Privilege. Privilege from a majority. And a privilege that allowed me to stay ignorant. Ignorant to, to the sayings and ugly things that I used to think and feel and walk in. The second challenge I took on was this whole, we're all one now. And it's not mine, but I heard it uh, on a marae. Well, if we're all one, let's all be Māori. That really resonated with me, didn't it? Because that's true, right? Because what's all one even supposed to mean? One what? Andrew, one what? Well, come, these are the thoughts I took on. Come on. You know what you mean by that? We're Kiwis. We're all together. Okay, so if you were asked to come dress in your national costume, friends are having a, into, like, a multicultural get-together dinner, Come in your national costume and let's share our, our dinners, our meals, our traditions, our values, our cultures. What would I go as? Because I'm not British and I'm not Māori. Couldn't wear a coat of white. I couldn't, what would I be, the British family or a Greek coat, a, a settler? I'd probably grab a t-shirt and gumboots maybe. <laughs> Rugby jersey. What would I talk about? Buzzy bees, ice cream, <laughs> tip-top ice cream, your blacks. <laughs> this is a question of Andrew, culture, what are your values? What are your beliefs as a New Zealander? A Pākehā New Zealander. That's what I am. I'm not Māori. I can't be Māori, right? I'm Kiwi. Pākehā Kiwi. So what are my beliefs? What are my values? What would I stand for? What would I fall for? Okay. Well, I believe in fear go, mate, she'll be right. Back the underdog. Oh, do you? Fear go, mate, what, unless you're Māori? Then let's get over it. Move on. I think I'm lost. I don't think I kind of have a culture that I can truly call mine. And that to me was seeding this fear, this natural response, why I couldn't look at a Māori flag without feeling threatened, why I'd never engaged or bothered to look. My privilege didn't, meant I didn't have to. My privilege meant I could stay in that place of absolute arrogance and uh, ignorance and racism. I was talking somewhere and somebody called, oh, that's harsh. Maybe, surely, you're just biased. Racism, it doesn't work anyway. You can't say that word, people switch off. I said, do they? But racism is a word, because it's a real thing. It's in the dictionary. This is any form of abuse. What if I punch someone out? Oh, I was just over uh, invigorated with testosterone. Well, it's violence. And we can't talk about it in our country. Why not? We can talk about other people's racism. Look at those Australians. Look at America and the civil rights movement. Those poor Aboriginals. At least we didn't do when it's back to them. That's the one. <laughs> Look at us. Oh, get over it. Move on. Sick of hearing it. It's a Pakia problem. And I say it's a Pakia solution. So I know it's only 15 minutes. So just carrying on this, this journey of representation. This question of a Māori world seat. Who designed that? Well, the government did. Local government. Who, uh, Labour, actually. Were in power at the time. 
not for consulting with Māori then, because it's tokenistic, right? My whole challenge with this Māori Ward seat isn't whether Māori Ward seat is the answer or not. It's the fact that only that decision, only that representative seat, has the ability to go to a petition for poll with a binding referendum. In other words, legislation in our country is like, what are we, 1840? Because you load the gun for the majority of non-Māori to decide which area has mayors at the table. It's hideous. The only party that's ever supported me on this whole journey is the Māori party. Yes, there's some Johnny Cup lately, and rightly so, because a good idea is a good idea, and I thank them for the support. And there's a government <laughs> supported by the Māori party. That'll be the closing date in December, and I urge you to go online and have a look. And really truly think about what this legislation is actually doing in its, what, in its construct. And every six years, every council in New Zealand has to decide who sits at its council table. It's called a representation review. Within that, there's, can, there's a few options. You can vote at large, or you can vote in a ward system. Wards being communities of similarity or interest. And for Taranaki, or my district, for example, we have rural wards and we have urban wards. The farmer says, I don't want the townies deciding for me. I'm the, I'm, that's their worldview. You might have to speak into the mic. Oh, sure. So, um, the, <laughs> You're on a roll, too. <laughs> so, um, there's no, I mean, there's no requirement under the treaty for the farmer to have a say at the table, but they do. So when a council resolves to establish a Māori ward, as I laid out to you, only that decision can go to a community to demand a binding referendum and a poll. The other ones, the other seats, the other wards do not. So here's the thing, right? I was able to get right up to the local government minister, Paula Bennett and Sam, who's just finished, even the Prime Minister, to say it is unfair, the process is unfair, to all of us, not just Māori, but to all of us. And do you know what they all say to me? No, a petition is just. It's right that the community should demand a poll. And do you know why? They said because it's race-based. I said, is that right? So what you really say is your legislation, which is the option to uh, include a Māori ward, is race-based. Somehow different until a council decides to do it, you have to follow me. Because actually it's treaty-based. And in fact, if you're going to truly honour it, it would be 50-50 round the table. This is just an insult to all of us, all our intellect, and everything that's ever happened, or not happened. Why do I know that? I'm a product of the ignorance. I used to say, rip up the treaty, it's, it's, it's had it. And I used to say, don't blame me. I didn't take the land. I didn't take the language. Life's hard for me too, you know. There's no Department of Entry Jet Affairs. <laughs> what I never realised was my privilege. What I never realised, I had no it to deal with. What I never realised was that attitude. Those thoughts and those words justified what happened and actually continued colonisation. So I stand today to A, thank you for the opportunity to speak, but to B, say, to say this to us. We don't know about past because in mainstream New Zealand, we raise our children to not know. We don't talk about it. We don't teach it. We simply demand Māori to get over it. It's bad enough we lie to the world. What's worse is we lie to ourselves, Pākehā. And if that divides, so be it, because that is simply the truth. And I say, is it relevant what you think of me? Whether you agree or not, what's actually crucial is what you think of yourself. Because in there lies the truth. Ask the questions that I ask of myself. You are the next generation of leaders. Put an end to what was handed to me in this the horrible seeds that I almost was doing to my own children and stop the cycle. No rera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato koutou. Hello? Yep. Ah, it's okay.
All right, fantastic. That was Andrew. Judd, give him another round of applause. That's it. It was so good to hear from you. Um, so now we have um, the Maori Party and co-leader, Marama Fox. Hey, kia ora, everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak into this since we've got some competing noise. Well, that was freaking awesome. Andrew Judd is such a rock star. He seriously is. Like, uh, to be able to stand up and own it, and then articulate it in a way that doesn't piss everybody off, but actually has people on the nod meter going, oh, I get that. Ah, and you, I, I went to New Plymouth when this debate came up before the referendum, and it was me and Willie J <laughs> on the same team, and uh, Matidia Tune. And then there was also on the other team we had uh, Winston, someone from Gareth Morgan's crew, and uh, some of the dude from the New, Ply New Plymouth District Council. And they, we were there to debate whether or not we should be allowed to have a Māori ward uh, in New Plymouth, which the council had already agreed to. And this is the only seat by number in the council that you can actually get a Māori seat dismissed. For any other seat in the council, you can't get a, a referendum of only 5% of the vote and then um, force, or from a petition, sorry, and then force the referendum, which is binding. You cannot, only for Māori ward seats. Isn't that fair um, and equitable? And haven't we come a long way? Uh, so it was phenomenal. We went down there to New Plymouth, and you could just tell in the room who agreed with who before anybody started talking, because half the room was like this. Actually, if I'm honest, maybe 80% of the room? 80% of the room looked like this. And they're like, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't care what the hell you have to say. I've heard everything you've had to say, and I'm not going to listen to you. And every time the other team got up, they'd sort of, okay, I can hear this, because they're, you know, similar stances. But by the end of the night, people had, you could tell when you start to win people over, because they physically relax their position and their stance, and you start to get the nod meter. And in fact, if some of you are doing politics and uh, public speaking and that sort of blah de blah then um, smile and nod. When you're speaking, find someone who does it back to you, because then you're talking to the converted in the room. And actually, smiling is infectious, so other people start to smile back at you, and then they go, geez, she's got shit that she's got, isn't she? Not away. It's a true thing. It's an actual thing. Anyway, but that's not the only reason we love Andrew Judd, not just because we smile and nod, but because we went, oh, my gosh, you are so right. And why is it, though, that we have to wait for the pale male style guy in the room to stand up and say, this is, I was a racist and this is the way he thinks, and everyone goes, wow, yeah, wow, actually. I mean, Marty been saying it for 177 years. And what have we got? Get back in your corner. This is one New Zealand. You've got a separatist agenda. You only want to do for Marty people. That's race-based funding. Well, actually... Yes, it is. And you know why? Because if we target our support to the area of most need and look at the demographic of people who fit in that area of most need, oh my gosh, look at that. They're mostly Māori. But do we build our systems to support them? Do we build uh, our solutions to ensure that they take on a cultural intelligence that we have a cultural literacy when we deal with people of ethnicity, no matter what ethnicity that is? Do we make sure that we are well-versed in their culture before we come and tell them what to do to fix themselves in this country? No, we do not. And so what have Māori done for 177 years? What have they done? Well, they're still here and they're still breathing. And we, together just want to be part of our communities because we have grown up beside you and grown up in this place forever, just like you have. Like, I was raised in my father's whakapapa in the education of my father's whakapapa. Then I know all about Joan of Arc and Queen Elizabeth the I, who was fantastic and a wonderful leader. And I know all about the first four ships into Canterbury. And I know about the bridal path and the settling and the pioneers and how they eat out a living from this desolate country. I know all about that. I also know how uh, we came here starving and bereft and accidentally fell upon this land and go, oh, look, here's some land. Yay, we live. 
that we were savages and uncivilized and uncouth. And this from the people who came out of England in the middle of the plague and pestilence and smallpox and um, school sores, which they now call Maori sores, which we did not have prior to colonization, just so you know. Um, herpes and what else? All of these things, the flu, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Those are not our nursery rhymes. We don't talk about little Jack Horner sat in the corner and rady ra rady ra you know, and Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Isn't that wonderful? I'm like, why the hell am I teaching my babies this? I started Kohanga Reo when I was 18 after learning the whakapapa of my father who every year after Waitangi in the 80s, because I'm a girl of the 80s, I'm not sure if you could tell, but it's a thing. Uh, anyway, so um, in the... In the uh, fuck up up with my father, my friends, my actual own friends, would say, my crowd, my crew, the ones I hang out with, they actually said to me, Marama, or if they were really nice to me, they'd say, Marama, Marama, why do you Maori people have to be so greedy? Why can't you just accept what you have? I had no answer. I went to the same school as them. I was educated in the same mindset as them. I had no answer. I just knew I was offended. And I wasn't even sure why. Because maybe they were distinguishing themselves from me saying, you marry people. Like when they slapped me when I was 10 because I beat her in a home run back to uh, home because I was pretty big and strong when I was 12. Have you seen Polynesian kids at school? I'm sorry, but when a Polynesian boy is 16 and they're playing rugby against a, a pocket boy who's 16, that's just unfair. Um, <laughs> here's a sterilization. Uh, ster generalization. Oops, wrong word. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I beat these kids at school and she slapped me because I beat her home and she goes, no, you didn't. She slapped me and she goes, little black girl. And I was like, first of all, I was incensed because I'd never been hit before in my life like that in anger by anybody and then I went home to my mother and I said mum am I black because I thought I was brown and she goes oh, who called you black and off she went to school to tell them off and so you know that's the fuck up upper of my father's education taught me that I was greedy and that I was at the bottom of every disparaging statistic there is in this country, and that, oh, poor you, Marama. And then I went to Kohangareo with my son, and I started learning the Matauranga Māori of my mother's whakapapa, who told me, that place we come from, it's not Tiwit, it's Te Whiti. And that's not Te Whiti or Rungamai from Taranaki, that's Te Whiti or Tutawake who crossed the river to save his sister, Haratoda Harakeke, who was going to kill herself because they were going to make her get married to some old Koroheke and she didn't like that. So she ran away and was going to take her life. But he said, no, 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 that's not how we solve our solutions. And nursed her back to good mental health, found her a new husband, settled the debt with the Koroheke. Go do your thing here, look, someone, she's your age. Anyway... And this is Toda Harakeke. So that place was named after Tutawake, Te Fiti or Tutawake, where he crossed the river to save his sister. But we don't know that, and we lived down the road from there our whole lives. We thought it was Tiwit. And the other place down the road, that was Kautra, not Kahutara. And when you go up to um, the dam to look for the place where our ancestors hid when the rampaging warriors came down with their muskets, that was not Kurao, that was Kodaro. I was like, oh my gosh. So does that mean we're not Rearies? We're Lady? Fine. Look at that. Anyway, that's the thing. The Whakapapa tells me different things. It didn't say I was greedy. It told me I was great. And I never wanted to put my children at risk of being told they were greedy ever again. And my babies have been educated in Matauranga Māori education from birth.
and they're all at university, three of them now annoying the freak out of you fellas in your lectures. I already know my son is so opinionated, you cannot shut that boy up. <laughs> Ricky Hanna, are you watching? You know it's true. Um, Jared Fox, he goes, he's doing what polls and law here. Lady White Fox is just doing clinical psychology. And Jordan, he's doing Pacific studies. Whatever that. <laughs> Sorry, it's a running family joke. We actually quite love it. He's lit, Jordan is on to his fourth language, so we're very proud of him. And they all go to university here, and they went to Matauranga Māori education every day of their life until year 12, when somebody had a great idea to send them to church college in Hamilton, uh, which they lapped up, loved, and, and flew in. And imagine that, a kaupapa Māori model of practice that still brings you success. Imagine that. Oh my word. So when we talk about a Māori prison, when we talk about whether or not we want to cope up a Māori model in the new Vulnerable Children's Ministry, when we talk about uh, cope up a Māori models of practice, that is race-based for a reason. Because if we want to make a change, we've got to give a change. We've got to get change. We've got to do change. And we have to stop believing that we cannot be the change makers in our own world. Of course we can. Of course we can. And we have a different model. We don't have to have a Victorian model of education that tells you to sit down, be quiet, do not speak, rule in the lines, please. We come from a Mātauranga Māori education where we process information from all our sources all at the same time to come to an answer. In my son's class, he could sing and haka at the same time as he was doing mass every day, and that was never a problem, ever. You know, it allowed them to release everything and grab everything all at the same time, process it, and still do okay. Oh, my gosh. Look at that, not a Victorian model of education, not a Westminster model of politics and parliament. Why the hell do we have to subscribe to that? Why is that the only way? Look how good that's done us. I say it all the time, people tell me off, but it's red undies and it's blue undies, it's the same damn skid marks for 177 years. It doesn't matter. These two governments, and I have to say, I do have a preference now after working with them both, but these two governments, red or blue, have ruled this country for exactly half amounts of time, pretty much, pretty much even amounts of time, ever since we got a party that wasn't national, because it was all national back in the day, right? And then we had Labour come along. And ever since then, they have ruled for exactly the same amounts of time, and Māori are still in the same damn position, but not anymore. And I'm going to finish with this, because I bet I'm way over time. But I'm going to finish with this. We are on the precipice of real greatness for Māori, and for this nation, because if we can eliminate disparities for Māori, we eliminate disparities for the whole country, and we bring our Pacifica whānau with us. Now, that is not a separatist model. That is not a one New Zealand model just because we might focus attention on a group that needs focus to remove disparity in a model that they understand, which actually, look at that, works better than the stuff they've been shoving down our throats in our greedy mainstream education system for 150 years. Because that education system was born on a piece of legislation that said the time has come whether to civilise the natives or to educate them, but if we are to educate them, we need to do so through a language that is more conducive to human thought. And then they outlawed Te Reo Māori in our schools. And then they made an amendment to that law two years later in 1869 that said, you can only by law teach Māori cooking, cleaning, nursing and nursemaiding. They essentially said, you can teach them to be our slaves. That's what they did. And now this is not anybody's fault. You don't have to feel guilty about this. You just have to understand that everything you got taught over there is not the only worldview that exists in this nation. And imagine if you understood both worldviews, if you could walk and talk in both languages, if you could walk and talk in both worlds, be accepted culturally here and there, and then be and be cultural. Because I was successfully assimilated and colonised. I still get kids who walk into my classroom when I'm teaching and they say, Marama, Marama, Excuse me, miss, I'm not Māori, I'm South African. 
I'm not even lying. This happened to me not six years ago. I'm not Māori, I'm South African. I said, boy, your name is Fata. You're my nephew. So, <laughs> why didn't he want to be known as being Māori? He was damn serious about that. He didn't want anybody to know he was Māori because being Māori meant everything that was bad and ugly and he wanted nothing to do with it. And we get parents who walk through the door because they've all been successfully educated over here, being told you're greedy and worthless and only good enough to be our servants. Now, you think that was a long time ago, but that piece of legislation stayed in place for 100 years and didn't get changed until 1969. Yay, about time. We've come a long way. Anyway, so that's politics. Politics today is about realising real rangatiratanga at the table of government. Who would have thought that this Tory government would have agreed to a manafakohono arrangement in the RMA that makes every, every local and regional council must, by law now, have an agreement with their local iwi about the management of their resources. Now, if that had happened 60 years ago before they started water allocation in this country where you get a corporate welfare because you consume water for nothing. doesn't matter if you're growing milk. You can grow milk. It takes 400 litres to make one litre of milk. And then when they've made it, they dehydrate it. They put it in a tin and they sell it overseas. What a waste of freaking time utilising all of that water and then dumping all their blinking effluent and their nitrogen and your leaching the earth is practically uh, it's the stench <laughs> and the pollution is rank in some parts of this nation but I've got to stop because I could do this all day we are realising real power we don't need 50% we only need 10 we had 10% of the vote in this country as an independent voice for Māori people that you don't have to be scared of us because we just want to live here with you two. And we just want to make sure our kids are not 63% of them in SIFs and 71% of them in prison, a youth prison, a Māori and 53% are men and 68% are women. We don't want that and we know the solutions and we need you to trust us that we can do it with your help together for the betterment of all of Aotearoa. That's not separatism, that's unification. Can I stop there? Uh, Mama Fox, everybody. Great. All right, so we'll just go into a, a, a Q&A from the audience now. See if we can... Oh. Let's start together, eh? <laughs> I'll try not to speak first. <laughs> okay, uh, we just have one for the audience and um, one of you guys. Okay, does yeah. um, anybody here have any um, questions? Share that. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, so your turning point was when you became mayor in 2013. How do you now... You had that... How do you then mobilise others like you, or how have you found others to acknowledge what you acknowledged in yourself? So I was just saying before, to, to when I came in, that... A bit of a strange phenomenon at the moment for me personally is every odd night I'm going out of my region to talk like I've just talked, but nothing at home. I can't explain that. Because actually, who I'd love to get in front of is old Andrews. Not to have the arguments, because nothing results from that. It's why I didn't stand again. I couldn't be the bait for hate. The media loved to spin him to say that it was because of the, the, the abuse and whatnot. That comes with the job. It could be rates, it could be a road, a pothole. That's part of it. This was more than that. This is about who we are. Who we are, how do we care for each other? So I just, I just, I'm like a sponge. I want to get in front of people to share the story, to get people to think and challenge back because nothing can be thrown at me from the uh, pleach face people that I didn't throw at myself. And uh, it's not to have the term thrown, but kind of in a way it is. But you know they don't. None of them do. They're either keyboard warriors or they're, they're, they're just gutless. So to, to really answer your question, that's right, to answer that question, back home, 
uh, by still being there, by walking proud, by making saying hello to people that look, look away when I come. Because I walk with the truth, and uh, I've got nothing to be shamed for. Hey. Okay, yeah, uh, we have um, a one question. Oh, did you want to... No, I'm just telling jokes. Okay, sweet. We have um, one question uh, from um, <clears throat> from a live stream. Uh, what specifically? Uh, this is to Marama Fox. Uh, what specifically would your ideal New Zealand society uh, look like? Oh, my ideal New Zealand society: um, a bilingual nation that has true understanding of each other's values, that has a multiple mix of um, Parker education and Māori education, uh, that has multiple platforms of. Here's a Māori court based on kaupapa Māori values of practice, and you can choose whether you want to go to Pākehā court or Māori court, but if you go to Māori court, you'll be judged and, and treated in a way that is, uh, comes under a tikanga-based framework. And so right now in this country, we have rangatahi court, and we have um, te kōti rangatahi te kōti whenua Māori, and we have te kōti matariki and kōti whānau taku mōio. And so those courts are run on marae in a kaupapa Māori model, and they are doing phenomenally well. And uh, the, the youth court that is run in that way is having a huge effect on reducing recidivism and having those young people turn their lives around instead of going on to a pipeline to criminality and incarceration. So my utopia for Aotearoa would be bilingual, and with, through the vehicle of Māori language is the uh, eyes to the world of Māori. And so knowing our history together, knowing our language together, knowing how we can support each other and the benefit of value-add of kaupapa Māori models of practice to our nation. All right, great. Um, anybody else in the audience have a question? Yep. Um, a little while ago, I think about a year, uh, you walked off um, the set of a television show uh, with, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the person in question was the owner of a, uh, a spokesperson for a tobacco company. The spin doctor. Yes, who, who you quite rightly... Doctor Death of Propaganda. Yes, you yes. quite rightly referred to him in those terms. Um, but how, uh, how do you reconcile being the co-leader of a party that has tobacco lobbyists in its caucus uh, and those views? Who's the tobacco, tobacco lobbyist in our caucus? The National Party has three former tobacco lobbyists. Oh, One is Chris I'm not Fisher. in the National Party. I don't no, wear but, blue undies. But, but, I wear but, Māori undies. But going into going, having an agreement that puts that party. Oh in look, we have an agreement to uh, we have a, a, an agreement to agree to disagree, which means I don't vote for everything they do. I don't even like everything they do, and I'll have my say about that. And so I've spoken personally to two of them, I didn't know there were three, but I've spoken to Chris and Todd um, about their association. I go, here they come, <laughs> not the death, as we walk through the door. But we've talked about that together, and I've told them what we've been able to proactively be able to do uh, since I've been in government for the last three years. But essentially, there are so many things I disagree with. We vote against it, but we, I still love people. I love people in the Labour Party, the Greens Party, the New Zealand First Party. Colin Winston is one of my best mates. Well, he's not a best mate, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm just trying to be truthful. But we have a good relationship. Like, we can talk, we can sit, we can have a laugh. We enjoy the banter uh, with each other. But I don't like his politics, and he quite obviously doesn't like mine. <laughs> so we, I, that doesn't mean I'm going to hate on him just means that I'm going to disagree with his politics and occasionally get really annoyed, like the other time when they changed the treaty settlement date, um, and have a go. But then I'll go back and say, look, I'm sorry, I lost my rag. Try and fix that up this time. Yeah. Can I just extend on that? Can I just want to make an observation? And it's not a pure question particularly, but I would say New Zealand hasn't fully understood MMP. Yeah. You know, councils yeah. still work on a first-past-the-post process. We as a country argued that there wasn't good fair representation in government, so we voted for MMP. What do we think is going to happen when we vote for those people to get Those there? blinking Māoris get a voice? Yeah, oh my gosh, put the them point, back in the so box. So the question I would have of, say, uh, an old people on the outside throwing stones at a minority party for being forming government, you know, as we have, what are you going to give up if you get elected? Don't tell us what's wrong all the time. Tell me what moral principles you would not join that party for, period. 
Because MMP means it's about coming together, trade-offs. That's what's happened. To sit in judgment because there's an extension of a different party is so unfair. Yeah, but I think what people do in politics, obviously, when they look at the Māori Party, is they say, was the trade-off too great? Did you give too much to get the advantage that you may have get? But that's because people read Facebook like a newspaper and um, believe political rhetoric as if it is the gospel truth being rolled out in front of the, the um, congregation. It is absolutely never like that. So uh, when they say vote for Māori Party is vote for national, it's rubbish. If I wanted to be a national, I'd wear blue undies. I don't. And so I will work with them, and I would work with Labour in a heartbeat if that's what the polls tell us at the end. But we have to make, uh, we have to make some compromises in order to advance things in a pragmatic way. But there are some times we will, we will just hold the line and say, no, that is not good enough. We agreed to the partial sell-off of state housing to social housing providers, right? So if you hear Mighty Party sold state houses, those bastards, how dare they, and now we have homelessness. We agreed to sell them to um, social housing providers because, quite frankly, Housing New Zealand are the biggest slumlord this nation has ever seen, and they treat our people appallingly with little and no respect. They don't put in systems that support them to be successful. They punitively um, sanction them if they don't toe the line and do what's told and, uh, and adhere to their regime of checking up on you. So why would we support more of that when we've got social housing providers who do a heck of a better job and are associated with whānau water and will put a family uh, counsellor with you if you want to to get you out of social housing and into your own house. That's what we support doing. But the rhetoric will tell you, those Maori Party, they agreed to sell the state houses, bastards. That's what they say. All right, um, do we have any more questions? Yep. So, I'm loud enough. I yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to the housing crisis, really, what is... Well, you know, there's getting people out of state housing and into their own housing. How do you plan on actually getting more housing? Uh, so right now across this country, there are there are four. I've seen 11,500 houses in development right now in Auckland, just in Auckland. I've been to every single housing development site in the whole of Auckland so I can understand the, this situation. I've talked with all the developers and the builders. I've talked with homeless people. I've done the homeless inquiry. I've been out to the marae to find out why did were you successful at Te Puya when Wins is not. Ah, because they treated them with some respect. There are some fundamental things we could change right now that would change homelessness in almost a heartbeat because finding the house was not the issue. <coughs> Keeping them in it was the issue. Supporting them with their underlying social deprivation was the issue so they could afford to pay their rent, right? So there are a number of things that we can do and have done. Uh, we've stopped the disposal of state houses. Um, we have stopped the... Um, the sell-off to um, social housing providers. If you want to be a social housing provider now, you have to build new, so we're adding to the stock. That's what we have done, in conjunction with the National Party, because I'll walk straight up to them and go, hey, this is what's going on in Gizzi, we need a solution, and this is what I'm proposing. They go, yes, we like that, we've got some money for this, let's go. Right? When I came into government, they spent zero money, zero dollars, on emergency housing in 2014. And I went in my very first meeting to the Ministerial Committee on Poverty. It was virtually within a month after the election. And I put a plan on the table and said, this is how you fix homelessness. They've done it in Utah. Here's a model. Here's a paper. That's all you have to do. Roll it out in New Zealand, please. It took them two years to do it, but they're doing it now. It's called the Housing First Model, where you put someone in accommodation, doesn't matter where it is, get them, put them in there, and then put support around them to deal with the issues of why they're homeless in the first place. That's a pretty simple expenditure of money that eventually will reap benefits greater than just shoving them back in a state house or leaving them on the street to consume the dollar and the purse of police and health and everybody else that works around them. So we've done a lot of things. A home ownership pathway, I know you're looking at that, but these are all things I've done, and I'm an apprentice politician of two and a half years. 
And I've been in this government for two and a half years, sitting at the table with these guys, bringing to them plans and solutions and ideas from the grassroots people who tell us we know what to do. Just give us the money. And that's what we do. You know, we provide the pathways for solutions. And so home ownership is definitely a pathway that we need to do. Fixing up rundown houses is something we already currently do. Right now through TPK, you can get money to fix up a rundown, derelict house that your family and your grandparents are still living in. Okay? So I could do this all day. But there are so many things that we're doing, but we only get to do them because we sit at the table where the decisions are made to get up. All right, uh, we just have time for one question, and um, it's going to, no, and it's, um, sorry, no, it's all good. And, we're, and it comes from our um, live stream, and it's a bit of a long one. It's a question to both. Regarding Māori seats on local councils, what do you think of the idea that Māori wards are different from geography-based wards, as most of the work councils do like roads, rubbish, rates, does affect people differently based on where you live, especially rural areas, whereas they don't involve treating Māori any differently. Also, um, do you, sorry, this is a bit of a long one. <laughs> also, do you think the case issues regarding Māori seats on local councils are different in councils like other huts, um, to um, question is um, hometown, but yes. all councillors are elected at large and there are no wards? Oh my gosh, you better start, because I'll just... So I would say that person go back and start from the beginning and read the history of New Zealand. Start at the principles of the treaty. Start by actually reading what happened when settler governments created New Zealand. Māori were never at the table. Imagine if the democracy that we defend today existed then. New Zealand would be completely different. Our water would not be polluted. That's right. Because Māori weren't even allowed at the table. We never had an issue then, did we? They're my weightable, swimmable. We need drinkable. We sat next to water in its pristine state. I have grandparents and, oh, nannies, nannies, not grandparents, nannies, who talk about growing up on the river every morning, catching an eel, living in a dirt floor fuddy. Further to that, today, think about this. A recent experience that I had as the mayor was to do with an oil company coming inland and a Wahitapu site. And hearing around that council table, oh, the bloody Marys, we're going to have to deal with this, aren't we? Oh, my word. Now stop and pause for a minute, whoever's viewing and asking that question. <laughs> How would you feel if we wanted to go and draw the oil on Gallipoli? Think about it. Do you know every every Māori war, land war site in this country has a road running straight through the middle of it? You know, if you go to Gallipoli, to where um, people were killed, you know, tragic loss of life, it is hallowed ground. If you go to the United States where they have civil uh, war sites, it is hallowed ground. You go to a Māori land war site, there is a road running straight through the freaking middle of it, and there might be some paddocks and some cows or some houses. And nobody even knows. And more people died in New Zealand in the New Zealand land wars than in both world wars from New Zealand. But nobody even knows or cares. Uh, can I say to this person, hello. <laughs> <laughs> there is an irrational fear in this country that if you give Māori a say, they might hurt you. <laughs> there might be something wrong with that. But if they sit at the table with you, you do not have to fear that. That is unifying. That is not separatism. I'm just saying it's an irrational fear, and I've worked out what that fear is. That fear is that we might do to you what once was done to us. Oh, my word, wouldn't that be disastrous? But we don't want that. We just want to get rid of disparity and have equitable outcomes. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm sorry yeah. that was smarmy and not very nice. What's the truth? Okay. Are you guys finished? Or? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, okay. Um, if you guys have any more questions, they might stick around. Um, I so, seriously uh, can't. I'm supposed to be back in <laughs> Okay, right. Uh, once again, uh, thank you uh, to. Um, uh, yeah, we also have a couple of um, Pavlovas that we want to give to you another token of appreciation. Yay! <laughs> Oh, my word, yes, please. Yeah. It's, uh, we call our club Pav, so you get a Pavlova. Thank you so much. I'm excited for... about that. Thank you so much to the audience for um, coming. Thank you so much for our guests for taking the time to speak for us tonight. And uh, we all hope you have a very good evening. Kaki te anoho.
I have verbal diarrhea. I know, I literally don't have verbal diarrhea.